Okay, so House of the Dragon is about to change the game of Thrones and episode 9 has a lot going on with it. In this video, we're going to be breaking down what happens in the episode, the easter eggs, book differences and also giving our thoughts on what could happen in the finale next week. This has been a massive season and I want to thank you for all your support so far. We recently got our million subscriber plaque and it means more to me than a seat on the Iron Throne so I really appreciate the love. Now, the episode is called The Green Council and this term was coined by Grand Maester Munkin in the book. The name brings a lot with it as it of course shows how this once unbiased council has now been twisted by Alison into supporting her side. Whereas the previous episodes all centred around chapter 12, we are now in 13 which is titled The Dying of the Dragons, The Blacks vs Greens. The war between the houses took place between 129 and 131 AC and the two years featured a lot of deaths and the characters treating the Iron Throne like it was a game of musical chairs. This period is known as the Dance of the Dragons but in the book it's said the phrase Dying of the Dragons is a lot more suitable. The work is very much a chronicle of this time told to us by witnesses and maesters and it states that due to them trying to add a poetic flair to the story that they changed it to dance. However, it's an extremely brutal period that's described as seeing several of the last dragons being wiped out. The source material says it was a war marked by stealth, murder and betrayal which we see from this opening. The death of Viserys has massively rocked the kingdom and due to his final words, Alicent now believes she must place Aegon on the throne. This is a change up from the books as in those the final speech by Viserys never happened as the Valerian steel dagger didn't feature in the story at all. I actually prefer the way they've done it here though with Alison actually believing her BS instead of just doing it solely for power like she did in the book. Now we open with a somber scene in which we see the throne and rooms of King's Landing completely desolate. We hear a single piano note striking away mimicking the sound of a bell. When a monarch died, the bells of King's Landing were typically rang out to announce it, however Alicent holds these back so she can plot and plan away. And when the source material, a servant went to give Viserys a glass of Hippocrass which is when they found him dead. They quickly rushed to Alicent and told her immediately and she called together the council. The servant who found Viserys was immediately put into custody and locked away so they couldn't discuss it with anyone. Here they change things up slightly though so that the servant goes to her handmaiden Talia who then passes it on to the queen. Though she eventually does get jailed along with the others, she lights candles signalling the king has passed away so that the underworld can also put their plans in place. The book had them keeping Viserys' death quiet for a week so that they could organise everything to put Aegon on the throne. Here though it plays out slightly differently with them being a bit more respectful. In the book his body was left in the chambers with the door locked and the rats start to feast on him. Throughout the season we've seen as these have slowly got closer and closer with them appearing at the wedding before showing up in his room. The paragraph on him reads, A day passed, then another. Neither Septons nor Silent Sisters were summoned to the bedchamber where King Viserys lay, swollen and rotting. No bells rang, ravens flew, but not to Dragonstone. They were instead sent to Old Town, to Casterly Rock, to River Run, to High Garden, and to many other lords and knights whom Queen Alison had caused to think might be sympathetic to her son. Some of the council did want Rhaenyra to be told but Alicent forbid it so that she couldn't come back and claim her kingdom. As for the Silent Sisters, we actually see them appearing in this episode preparing Viserys' corpse. Last week they did the same for Vaymond and they'd typically be brought in to dress the body so that it could have a funeral in line with the house. For example, we see Viserys being wrapped in the same things that were used on his wife Emma and also his child Balin in episode 1. However, Vaymond's would have been dressed for a burial at sea like Lena who who, who is also pretty cremated too. Anyway, Olivia Kirk delivers a great performance on hearing the news and there's almost like there's some relief along with the sorrow she feels. She immediately goes to Otto and obviously she knows it's going to be difficult for everyone to believe that she heard him saying Aegon should be put on the throne. But he didn't love and you'd bloody know that if you'd been watching the videos. Now the Valerian steel dagger gets passed to Aegon come the end of the episode and this explains how the prophecy didn't then get passed on from king to king like it had been before. There's lots of things that happened down the line but I suspect this will just get lost to time with Rhaenyra being unable to show her offspring the words because she doesn't possess the blade. Now if you're wondering where Rhaenyra and Daemon are in this episode then you might remember that last time that they said they were going to Dragonstone. There's a big event possibly coming in Rhaenyra's life next week that we'll talk about in the book spoiler section at the end of the video. I think it was a risky move just focusing on the greens but personally I like the choice with it very much showing how much conspiring and betrayal that there was in the kingdom. Rhaenyra being detached from this really splits the sides and will make the audience root for her even more because we've seen firsthand how many people are working against her. 
I read a couple of complaints from Team Green saying that the show paints Rhaenyra out as an angel when she really wasn't, but I think that kind of character development will be reserved for Season 2. Now this video is sponsored by Established Titles, a gift that lets you become like your favourite Lord or Lady in House of the Dragon. Did you know there's a traditional Scottish custom to have landowners referred to as a Lord, Lady or a Laird? That's why I was super interested in this project which allows you to get at least one square foot of dedicated land in Edelston, Scotland. It's also a great way to help out the environment as established titles will plant one tree with every single order. They work with charities like One Tree Planet and Trees for the Future to help with reforestation efforts. So if you pick up a plot you can refer to yourself as a lord whilst helping to preserve the picturesque woodlands of Scotland. Now there also comes a bit of an ego boost on top of all this environmental stuff. Because you're now a lord, laird or a lady, you can officially change your name on things like credit cards, plane tickets, your dating profile, whatever you want to do. As you can see here they give you an official certificate and it also details the exact location of your unique plot number. On top of this, established titles have also told me that the first 200 people who use my link below will be placed within walking distance from my plot. Depending on how many of you want to become a lord, lady or laird, we can build our unique heavy spoilerdom kingdom together. You can be like Lord Kevin Spoilers, you punk. I'll see you, chump. Established Titles is actually running a massive early Black Friday sale right now. Plus, if you use the code heavy spoilers, you get an additional 10% off. Go to establishedtitles.com slash heavy spoilers to get your gift and help support the channel. Makes for a great last minute gift. You can get yourself involved in all the House of the Dragons drama. So definitely go check it out in the description below. Thanks. From here we jump to the council, and Tylan Lannister ends up cracking this one. What is it that could not await an hour? Was Dawn invaded? Dawn exists in the southlands of Westeros, and it's a place that we visited in Game of Thrones. The king is dead though, Elvis has left the building, and now they have to decide what to do. Alison is actually painted out as being very different to how she is in the book, with her almost being reluctant over doing this whole thing. She's shocked to learn others on the council have planned Aegon will succeed his father, and it turns out that both Otto and Tyland have wanted this for a long time. This is shot towards the end that I absolutely love, where you can see him realising the day he's waited on has finally come. It's finally materialising before his very eyes, and the guy just seems so happy that it's all coming together. Now instantly, Lord Beesbury wants to shut this conversation down, and there's discussion of the lords that already swore allegiance to Rhaenyra in episode 1. This happened in 105 AC, and the show has a line that somewhat touches upon what appears in the book. Hundreds of lords and landed knights swore fealty to the princess. That was 20 years ago, most of them are now dead. Now the source material says, Sir Tylan pointed out that many of the lords who had sworn to defend the succession of Princess Rhaenyra were long dead. It's been 24 years, he said, I myself swore no such oath, I was a child at the time. In the work Orwell originally opened the meeting by reviewing the customary tasks and procedures with the death of a king, but Otto cut him off and said, All this must needs wait until the question of succession is settled, until such a time as our new king is crowned. Notice that word king, and someone quickly replied saying, Until our new queen is crowned. This line later gets played upon by Otto when he says, The door remains shut until we finish our business. Bees breed doesn't bees leave it, and he even accuses someone of murdering Viserys in his sleep. This is something that we've touched upon in other videos, and it's one big you time, you time, you time. So in the book, there was talk about how Alicent may have poisoned Viserys, and that he played a big part last episode. Damon ended up sniffing it suspiciously afterwards, and later on, Otto offered it to Viserys. However, he turned this down, and he managed to regain his strength to the point that he went to the throne room and also held his last supper. Side note, this was obviously playing on the Last Supper from the Bible too. Anyway, the tea was then given to him that night, and though I don't, I don't think Alison killed him, there probably will always be people who talk about how she could have. Due to her reaction over the corpse though, I don't think it's the case, and she seems genuinely gooder that he's gone. Anyway, that's in a new time, new time, just a theory. You only hear people talking shit about it. Don't kick off, you idiot, a theory. Now Lord Beesbury's death plays out in several different ways in the book, depending on which account you listen to. As always, there's slightly different sources over what happened, but they all end in his death. Grand Maester Orwell said that Lord Beesbury was seized at the door by the command of Sir Otto Hightower and then escorted to the dungeons. Here he was confined to a black cell, and he apparently died of a chill whilst awaiting trial. Septon Eustace gets it the closest though, as we see how he's killed by Kristen in the council room. The work describes him as opening his throat with a dagger, Raz here, he smashes his head like it's the like button. Either way, this is classed as the first blood that was drawn during the Dance of the Dragons. 
The book later states that Orwell would later claim that he said a lot of things that Beesbury did, and this was so he could come out looking good. The Lannister, bloody title and Lannister lad, he also ends up taking over as the master of coin in the wake of his death. Harold Westerling immediately draws his sword, and as episode 1 showed, he's very loyal to Rhaenyra. He instantly recognises what this has turned into, and vacates his position. This is similar to how Barristan Selmy would quit after the death of Robert Baratheon, who as we know, thinks everyone's a bloody bastard. Now he does this in the wake of Otto ordering him to take his knights to Dragonstone in order to kill Rhaenyra. With him being out, Kristen gets put in as the Lord Commander, which will mean that Alicent has someone loyal to her heading up the King's God. However, the book had the events play out differently, with Westerling dying in 112 AC almost 20 years before the death of Viserys. Kristen still got to the same place, but he wasn't used as a weapon like what Alicent does here. Add some drama to it, and the plans to kill Rhaenyra are put in place due to knowing that she won't bend the knee. Alicent is the one who ends up saving her, and she refuses to let them go ahead with the assassination of her old friend. Last episode, they seem to bury the hatchet, and if we're talking about karma, this could be something that saves Alicent in the end. Typically, what goes around comes around in Game of Thrones, and if we look at this having this side to it, then it might be what saves her in some way. Laris hangs around like a bad smell at points, but in the source material, he was invited to the council. He actually sliced his hand open and influenced the others into taking a blood oath, and though he gets some body fluid on his hand later, it's not really the same thing. And we cut to Helena sewing together a spider. Her mother had her studying insects instead of dragons, and this played into the funeral episode in which she too looked over a bug. She once more drops this line, There is a beast beneath the boards. Which calls back to last week when she said the same thing. You are the beast beneath the boards. Well done, my boy. Now this is likely referring to the dragon that pops up at the end of the episode. It comes from the boards under the dragon pit, and likely seems to be that. However, it might be something else, but it's such a big spoiler that I'm going to save it for the end of the video. So stick around, chump. See ya, chump. Now it's also important to bear in mind that we see her two twin children here, in Jaehaerys and Jaehaera. In the book, they were taken to Viserys on the morning he died, and he told them the stories of their names and the great king Jaehaerys. Anyway, we cut across to Eric Cargyle, who was supposed to be Aegon's loyal protector. We get to learn why he's now just reduced to quiet quitting, and the reasoning behind why he doesn't protect Aegon. Similar to how Rhaenyra snuck out in episode 4, we discover that Aegon has used the secret passages in order to leave the Red Keep. Now Eric and Arik Cargyle are identical twins who end up supporting opposite sides to each other. They've briefly appeared in the series so far, with one advising Queen Alison last week in the Red Keep. The twins are identical, and in the show, they're going to be played by Luke Titansaw. Heh heh, Titansaw, Titansaw. <laughs> anyway, both, both knights in, fought in the tourney that was shown in episode 1, and the pair were knocked off their horses by Sir Kristen Cole. Arik was also the knight in the book who said that he found Damon and Rhaenyra in bed together, and this slowly started to spread that rumour throughout the kingdom. Arik ended up going with the Greens, and due to his brother being on the opposite side, he was chosen to pose as him for missions down the line. Elsewhere, Rhaenys is locked in her chambers, and she relies on Arik saving her later on. Kristen too is given the same mission by Alicent, and we see Aemon sitting in front of a fire. This brought back a lot of imagery to me of when Damon sat in front of one at the end of episode 2, and I love how they're showing how the pair mirror one another. As the investigation gets further along, we also discover that Aegon is father to son, which could massively mess up the line of succession. Now Aegon's bastards are mentioned in the book, alongside the three children that he had with Helena. These were Maelor, and the twins Jaehaerys and Jaehaera. As for the bast- sorry I keep calling them bastards, I sound like Robert Baratheon, you bloody bastard. Now as for the bastards, the book reads, a wife and children did little to curb the carnal appetites of Prince Aegon the Elder. If Mushroom is to be believed, he fathered two bastard children the same year as the twins, a boy on a girl whose maidenhood he won at an auction on the street of Selk, and a girl by one of his mother's maidservants. The former is the one that we meet in the episode, and the street of Selk was basically a red light district that existed in King's Landing. Damon frequented a lot too, and it's where he gave his air for a day speech back in episode 1. Now it is possible that the former is also born because the plantee from last week was sabotaged. The servant who gave it to the queen was revealed to be a Mazaria informant, and therefore it is possible that she prepared the drink without putting this ingredient in it. This would mean that the child could still be born, and it may end up popping up in season 2. Now it turns out Aegon took Aemon there when he was 13, and though there's no mention of this in the book, Aegon is described as going there a lot. The book also goes into how Aegon was found differently to what happens in the entry. They say that Kristen found him in a flea bottom rat pit with a girl who couldn't have been more than 12. The book then goes on to say, 
Though the good Septon admits Prince Egon was with a paramour when he was found, he insists the girl was the daughter of a wealthy trader and well cared for besides. Moreover, the prince at first refused to be part of his mother's plan. My sister is the heir, not me, he says in Eustace's account. What sort of brother steals his sister's birthright? Only when Sir Criston convinced him that the princess must surely execute him and his brothers should she don the crown did Egon waver. Whilst any true Targaryen yet lives, no strong can ever hope to sit on the Iron Throne, Cole said. Rhaenyra has no choice but to take your heads if she wishes her bastards to rule after her. It was this, and only this, that persuaded Egon to accept the crown that the small council was offering. Now eventually they come across him in the Sept, which isn't the kind of place you'd expect to find him, so it's the perfect hiding spot. In the throne room, Otto asks for the lords to break their oaths in order to side with Egon. Here we see Lord Caswell, who was one of Rhaenyra's loyalist supporters. He greeted her as she climbed the stairs with Joffrey, and also showed up last week. He fakes being loyal to Egon, but secretly, he wants to head off like Vaymond. Unfortunately, he's caught, and the work tells us that he's beheaded, but here he ends up being hanged. Cut across to the aforementioned flea bottom rat pit, and we see the teeth of children being looked at before they're tossed into the arena. The work also mentions that Egon was found with two gutter snipes with filed teeth that were biting and tearing at each other just for his amusement. Now though, he's not here, and Eric tells his brother this kind of shows who the king truly is. He wants him to come with him to the Blacks, but alas, they end up falling apart. Now speaking of going to the Blacks, we see Caswell moving through the court which has black and red soldiers in it. Last week, Vaymond was brought in by the Hightower ones, and this plays his hand to show he chose a place loyal to Rhaenyra to try and make a move. One of Miseria's servants goes to Eric and Eric, and we hear the nickname of the White Worm. Cut across to Viserys being prepared, and we see the crown being placed onto his body to burn with him. In the book, she ordered for it to be put in a vault, but a servant stole it and then ran off with it. If you watch the trailer 50 times like I have, then you, you'll you'll know that this might not be the last time we see it, but I, I won't spo- oh, I've already f***ing spoiled it. Anyway, Rhaenys is still in a cell, and Alicent goes to her and asks her to join her side. Rhaenys mirrors Rhaenyra beyond just her name, and similar to her, she was the next in line, but this was taken away with a man getting the throne. It's sort of like poetry they rhyme, and Alison even admits that Rhaenys should have been queen. However, she also clearly knows the kind of monster that Aegon is, and for some reason still wants to prop him on the throne. Alison says that if Rhaenys puts her dragons on the green side, then Rhaenyra will hesitate to strike, and this very much sets up the statement that she does at the end in the ceremony. Otto meets with Myseria, who reveals she's got leaks like Reddit before the She-Hulk finale, and Myseria is a tragic figure who in the book actually did fall pregnant to Daemon. However, she lost it during a storm at sea because Viserys forced the pair to split up, and in the end she had to travel away from Westeros. She'll give up the location of Aegon, but she wants to change things in the area, including the fighting pits that involve the children. Sonya Mizuno is a great actress, and check out the dance moves in Ex Machina to show how she can shake things up. Now whether Otto changes things or not remains to be seen, and him potentially not doing this could set up the blood and cheese storyline that we'll talk about later on. Aegon is brought out, and this separates the twins. Aemon and Kristen have tracked them down, and fight, 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 fight! Now Aegon doesn't want to rule, and he even talks about getting a boat and sailing away. This is similar to Laenor, who would have sat on the throne beside Rhaenyra, but instead he fled and actually managed to get a happy ending. Alicent confronts Otto, and very much blames him for trying to install Aegon, much in the same way that he installed her. Alicent orders terms to send to Rhaenyra, instead of the assassins, and she makes Aegon take Aegon the Conqueror's crown and carry his sword Blackfire. Now Aegon the Conqueror's crown brings a lot with it. Viserys' crown was previously owned by Jaehaerys, and the pair were both kings that sought peace. Juxtaposing this, Aegon's crown was what he used in his conquest to take six of the seven kingdoms, and it's normally been worn by kings who seek out domination. Maegor the Cruel also donned it before Aegon II did, and it carries way beyond simply being a headpiece. There's different accounts over what it's actually made of, with some saying it's Valerian steel, whilst others say that it's iron. This was originally adorned with rubies, which are missing here, but if you look closely, you can see the indentation for them. There's also lots of symbolism to this being placed on a green cushion. This is of course the colour of the high towers, and the crown now sitting on this shows who now has control of the realm. One of the few images in the books depicts Kristen Cole placing this on Egan's head, which is something that we also get in this scene. Aemon looks over it, and there's a lot going on with his face. Much like Daemon, he did have some deep-rooted desires to rule, and we might explore what happens with this in future episodes. At one point in the book, he does end up wearing it very briefly, 
and he says that it looks much better on him than it does on his brother. He's clearly meant to mirror the character, and not only is his brother now the king, but he also walks the streets of King's Landing in a hood in order to hide his hair. Now earlier in the episode, he brought up how he's more fitting of a king, and I wonder if they're going to add some division between the two. Would be wild if we had a civil war within a civil war, and this civil war section could add even more drama to the show. Like the Riddler appearing in the room, Lara's shows have been Allison's looking as creepy as ever. He tells her about Mazaria, whilst we see Quentin Tarantino's favourite scene in the episode playing out before our very eyes. I don't know about giving the guy with a bad foot a foot fetish, um, it's a bit on the nose, I don't know, and the guy starts banging his sept in, and again, Allison is just being used to get men off. Time for a joke. What's Laris Clubfoot's favourite place to hang out? Clubfoot. He reveals Talia and suggests killing Mizaria, which is going to have major repercussions down the line. It's all tying into that spoiler section at the end potentially, and stick around yet, yeah, stick around if you want to ruin it for yourself. Now Eric rescues Rhaenys and they go past the Black Dread Skull. It stands as a monument to Viserys' dragon and he never took one after its fall. Rhaenys pauses for a moment to look at it and I believe they exit the Red Keep using the same passage that Rhaenyra did in episode 4. You watch a burning building, that's likely Laris' minions killing the spies so that the kingdom is now clear. Cut to a parchment that gets rolled out, and I've paused this and read it through, so you don't have to. It constantly mentions the Seven, as in Faith of the Seven and the Seven Kingdoms. Egg on the Second is brought up too, and we see this tactic being brought into our own politics as well. Boris Johnson was often referred to as being like Churchill, and Liz Truss is often mentioned as being the same as Margaret Thatcher. However, unlike Egon the Conqueror, the second of his name doesn't want to rule and he's completely pathetic. He even brings up how his dad didn't love him, which was touched upon last week. At this point he's given the dagger, but the truth of this is meaningless because Egon doesn't know what it foretells. It's now just an ornament, a hollow symbol of royalty, much like how this whole charade is. Once more Alison tries to impress on him that he can't kill Rhaenyra, but he interrupts this with this line. Do you love me? You imbecile. Alison's reaction here gives a lot away, and again, it's Olivia Cook completely nailing the material. She makes a joke out of the situation, but subtly shakes her head, giving us the clear answer that she's thinking no. However, she does throw herself in front of the dragon come the end of the episode, and I'm going to need a YouTube body language expert to come in and break this down, because I, I feel like she's saying no. Rhaenys wanted to go to the dragon's pit, and she sees an in when the crowds start to huddle towards it. This is where the coronation was held in the book, but they do alter some major things. In the source material, Egan's Dragon Sunfire was unveiled to the public here, and he wrote on the back of it as it flew three times around the location. The book can often be seen as propaganda, and therefore, you can see how they twist this disaster into something more positive. You might also notice the Targaryen symbol behind Alicent is now gold instead of red, and this was changed during Egon's rule in order to mimic Sunfire. The crowd react really well to Egon being crowned, I think this makes him start to enjoy being in the role. George R. R. Martin's work is often seen as being a criticism of the monarchy, and how stupid it is to let people rule due to their bloodline. There's also that stuff where they're apparently chosen by God, and how stupid it is is definitely the case here. We all know Egon shouldn't be ruling, but people have brought him in, and now he's very much part of the system. The crowd cheers, and Egon draws the Conqueror's sword, finally realising he has power of the entire realm. Otto looks as proud as my granddad was when I took over the spoiler game, but Alison sadly has regret in her eyes. The cheers quickly turn to screams, and the celebrations are cut short by Rhaenys' dragon, named after one of the old gods of Valeria, she wrecks the entire place, and this could explain why it fell into disrepair. Though this also happened due to the dragons dying out, come the end of Game of Thrones, it was a shell of its former self. She could kill them all at this point, but instead she makes it clear to not f*** with her family. I would have went Dracarys on the whole lot, but Viserys' children are still there, and she sees a mother simply protecting her child. Alicent was of course desperate to have her on her side, but what a badass way to end off this episode. Gave me chills watching her fly away, and yeah, that final scene is very haunting. Similar to Rhaenyra, she was supposed to be the queen, but she had this taken away from her because Jaehaerys wanted a male to rule. Rhaenys sees history repeating itself, and due to her granddaughters being betrothed to the strong, sorry, Targaryens, she rightly sides with them. This ending very much serves as a warning of how Rhaenys can bring it all crashing down if she wants to. It's pretty much saying she could have killed them if she wanted to, but she let them live because they don't have the power that she does. 
she warns them they have a lot of dragons and not to go against them unless she wants to see defeat like Lara Strong. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Now that wraps up the penultimate episode and it very much feels like the calm before the storm. I love how much chaos the realm has been thrown into and though our own passing of the monarch was a lot more straightforward, it's nice seeing the chaos that could have come from this. The episode is a perfect example of how ugly the high towers were and how they do anything in their quest for power. I love the added dimension that wasn't in the books too, which has Alicent misinterpreting Viserys' final words. This will now push her even further and all in all it's going to cause a major civil war that's going to make for some really gripping TV. It's crazy how much character growth we've seen since episode 1 and going back to that, Alison seems like a completely different person. Even though her son doesn't want to be the king, she's forced him to live out this ambition that was very much forced on her by her father. Lots of subtext with it and this was another great episode. Now as for the spoilers, I think next week's going to have some major events in it. I'm going to give you a heads up to back out if you don't want to know as it could ruin the ending of the series. Thanks for sticking with me this far into the video and hopefully I'll see you next week. Now Rhaenyra likely faces two major losses next week. The first comes in the form of her son Lucerus who is killed by Aemon after he demands an eye from him. When the ravens were sent out for help, storms then became a priority and thus Alicent insisted Aemon go himself. He travelled out there on the back of Aegar and offered to marry one of Lord Boris' daughters. Lucerus arrived not long after and he couldn't do the same thing as he was already betrothed to his cousin. Aemon ended up following him after he was taunted by one of Boris's daughters that he didn't pick and he ended up killing Luke. Daemon then promised her a son for his son and this could tie into the beast beneath the board's prophecy. This has popped up twice now so I'm, I'm guessing it's very very important. Like I said, it could be the dragon but there could be more to it. Daemon goes to Mazaria and asks her to kill one of Egon's children and she sends in two assassins called Blood and Cheese. They end up using the secret passages to infiltrate the Red Keep and perhaps the prophecy being mentioned twice is referring to these two different events. It might be a reach. And Mazaria is known as the White Worm so that covers the beast bit and the assassins sneaking in could refer to them being beneath the boards. And back with Rhaenyra she goes into labour and during this she discovers that the throne's been stolen from her. This causes immense stress on her body and for days she wails going through the horrendous birth. She screams monster at the child and then when it's born it comes out deformed and carrying a dragon's tail. Rhaenyra says that Alicent stole her child and the throne from her in one fell swoop. I can see this being how they end this series with this becoming the final nail in the coffin that makes Rhaenyra realise she can't negotiate with the Greens. After this the Council of the Blacks is created to combat the other side and that season 2 is going to leave me looking like Viserys, drained, dead inside and just waiting for it all to be over. So that's the video and obviously I'd love to hear your thoughts and what you want to see in the finale. We are in competition right now and giving away 3 copies of Top Gun Maverick on the 15th of November and all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with the notifications on and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episode. We picked the comments at random on the 15th and the winners of the last one are on screen right now so if that's you, message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, make sure you check out our Breakdown of Rings of Power which will be linked on screen right now. We discussed the finale in all its detail so definitely head over there right after this. Out of the way, thanks for sticking through the video. I've been Paul, and I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.